Thanks everyone for coming. It's it's so great to see such a good turnout for this really important seminar. Um, and so I'm Rachel White. I'm an assistant professor here. I'm chair of our um, Department of Climate Emergency Committee. Um, this is Ursia Abbas. She's done a lot of the work for the committee organizing this fantastic seminar. Ursia is going to introduce you to um, this panel of four fantastic speakers that we have for you. Um, but first, I just do want to do a land acknowledgement. Um, we are gathered here today on the ancestral, um, territorial, and unceded territory of the Musqueam. And when we say unceded, we essentially mean stolen. Um, and so this is really, it's both important and quite difficult for me um, to do these sorts of land acknowledgements as someone who is a white European settler who has within the last three years come to Canada and it is the colonial Canadian government who has said that I am welcome here. It is not the indigenous peoples on whose land I am now living and working. And so it's really important for me to think about um, what, what it means when we do a land acknowledgement. And I think we can tie this um, clearly into um, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation this Saturday on the 30th of September. And so it's clear there's, there's two parts of that. There's truth and reconciliation. And doing these land acknowledgements, it's acknowledging that we are here on unceded territory is the truth. That's the truth part of that. But there's a second important part of that um, statement. It's truth and reconciliation. And so we first have to acknowledge, but we need to go a step further than that and think about, well, what can we be doing towards reconciliation? Um, and so here today, we've just shared um, five sort of Instagram accounts. Um, these all share um, information. They have action, um, calls to action. They have um, places you can donate. These are five indigenous um, uh, Instagram accounts. Um, they have websites attached to them. And so if you're interested in finding out more information and finding out what can you do to take these steps towards reconciliation, um, these are some great places to start. And also, thank you all for coming to this seminar. This is also, you know, addressing some of these key issues. Um, okay, and so a little bit of the background of why we're doing this seminar is actually came from a letter written by the undergraduates in our department, um, who really pushing for more information um, about environmental justice, about climate justice, and saying that as a department, we need to be recognizing this, we need to be talking about this. Um, and so, yeah, we sort of realized that we needed a bit more um, discussion about this, more information. Um, and so, yeah, Urshi has invited these fantastic four speakers to come um, give sort of an introduction about sort of what is environmental justice um, and how, how does it fit in within the academic setting. Okay, Urshi, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Arisha. <laughs> um, so before we get started, I would just like to introduce all of our wonderful speakers. All four of you are so amazing and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, I think it'll really help jumpstart things in the department and get some cool climate justice initiatives running. Um, so starting off with Anjali. Um, so Anjali is a climate justice organizer and campaigner. Um, Anjali got her start in organizing um, through youth movements around the world um, to ensure that the Global South social movement demands were heard in the um, halls of power. So today, Anjali is the campaign director of the Climate Emergency Unit, um, and she also runs the Panama Center for Climate Justice. Um, so the Panama Center for Climate Justice is a project that brings together diasporic communities to build power around issues of climate and economic justice. Um, Anjali is also engaged with the electoral system, running as the NDP candidate in the 2021 federal election and as a candidate in the 2022 BC NDP leadership race. Um, after Anjali, we're going to hear from Amanda Jiang, who is an assistant professor in the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability, and also part of the Department of Me Mechanical Engineering at the University of British Columbia, so here. Um, her research addresses environmental policy analysis through an interdisciplinary lens with a focus on developing better modeling tools and methods for addressing pollution and environmental injustice. Um, she also looks at the links between air quality, decarbonization, and equity to inform planning decisions. Um, after Amanda, we have Dargan, um, and Dargan is a climate scientist and educator. His recent um, Creative Commons textbook called Climate Justice and Energy Solutions is used in the Atmospheric Sciences Department um, at the University of Washington. 
Um, today, he'll be discussing how teachings from the climate justice movement can be incorporated into physical science courses um, at different levels, so like introductory to graduate levels. Um, and then lastly, we have Janelle. Janelle is an Afro-Indigenous climate justice and Indigenous rights activist from the Skeleton First Nations. Um, she's currently the interim co-lead of public engagement and mobilization at the David Suzuki Foundation and a guest on the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam territories. Janelle leans on her lived experience growing up on a reserve in Northern British Columbia to ensure that intersectionality is at the forefront of environmental narratives and to build power and help others to see their stake in fighting back against the status quo. Um, so yeah, we can get started with Anjali. Um, everyone, please give her a big round. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. I'm so um, so grateful to be to be here with all of you and um, uh, to be here, especially with my fellow speakers. Do you mind if I just put this right here? Perfect. My role today is going to be mostly to um, frame the discussion and and set up this time for the three um, my amazing co-speakers who are going to go into more detail. And and so my role here and what I'd love to do with you today for the next few minutes is just to give you an overview of this term climate justice that we hear thrown around and we hear predominantly now used to talk about the climate crisis. Um, and just to unpack that a little bit um, and, um, and and set up for, for um, these wonderful speakers as well. Um, for those of you who are here, actually, who's at the climate march? There was a big climate march in Vancouver on Friday, or who heard of it, at least, heard whispered about it. Okay, so we're in a definitely a room of, um, of familiar folks. Um, one of the main slogans for that march this year, and this was the result of a lot of broad, um, broad-based organizing and, and uh, coordination among many groups across Turtle Island was the slogan was fast, fair, and forever, not just Turtle Island, globally, actually. And so fast, fair, and forever is um, a sort of interesting entry point into this concept of climate justice, because it kind of brings together all the different elements of it. Fast, meaning we need an energy transition that is global, uh, that's unquestioned, everywhere in the world needs to go through an energy transition. Fair, meaning that not everywhere is going to go through the same kind of energy transition or as fast um, and forever, meaning it needs to be lasting, it needs to be equitable, sustainable uh, for all life on earth. And so for me, the climate crisis calls for this fundamentally interconnected and internationalist approach, one that we haven't really seen a lot of popular support for in Canada since uh, the anti-war movement, uh, since the anti-globalization movement. So for at least a couple of decades now, we haven't really seen movements in Canada that are that are calling for international demands. And uh, I think that that's a really important part of how to think about and reframe our understanding of climate justice. So I'll just start at the very, very beginning with a micro, um, micro history of the climate crisis. Um, so the climate crisis, as we all know, was kickstarted by the Industrial Revolution. And that great industrial period took place in North America and in Europe, mostly the countries that are today called the developed world. We enjoy uh, living in one of these such places. What enabled such prosperity in the developed world? It was two major things. It was the genocide and land theft of indigenous peoples across these lands. And it was the transatlantic slave trade from the African continent. And today, Africa contributes a tiny 2% to, of global emissions as an entire continent. But it was that uh, brutal forced labor that created the basis of so much of the wealth that surrounds us on Turtle Island today. So the two basic ingredients of global capitalism, land and labor, were both stolen by today's industrialized nations. And these nations industrialized and spewed carbon into the atmosphere enough to kickstart what we know as the climate crisis today. And so we cannot separate the ongoing ecological processes of the climate crisis from the fundamental and deep injustice that created the crisis in the first place. The poetry of the climate crisis is that a lot of the solutions are actually rooted in the antithesis to 
the deep divides caused by colonialism, by imperialism, and by ongoing um, wealth polarization and the forced spread of capitalism around the world. So some of these solutions, returning of land to indigenous stewardship, making use of ancient land use practices, um, and by confronting racism, colonialism, and inequality in all its forms. That's how we actually win on this crisis. There are several framings that are in use and in circulation around the world that try to get at this idea of climate justice. And so you might have come across them in, um, in your readings and your explorations of this. One of them is the framing of climate debt. Who's heard of the term climate debt or come across it in readings? Yeah, it's, it's a lot more popularized now. And it's essentially this idea of um, a wealthy elite. And, you know, I talked about it in terms of nations and countries, but it's, it's a lot more nuanced than that. Obviously, it's, it's got to do with a very, very, very small percentage of the world's population using up a large amount of the resources at the expense of the majority. And so the idea of climate debt is that uh, the wealthiest populations in the world got rich by emitting way more carbon than uh, they actually had the right to, causing irreparable loss and damage to other parts of the world, other populations in the world and ecosystems. And so the idea of climate debt is the, is the sort of reparation of that. Um, and the idea that there is, um, you know, for a country like Canada, for example, in our role at the United Nations, we not only have an obligation to reduce our emissions all the way, so 100% emissions reductions as soon as possible, but we actually have an obligation to go beyond that, an additional 40 to 60%. And the way we do that is by supporting emissions reductions in other parts of the world. So that's our climate debt. Everything over 100% of our own emissions reductions is our climate debt as a country. Uh, another framing that uh, that is now gaining more popularity is the right to equitable atmospheric space. And that is the concept that every person um, has the right to an equal amount of atmospheric space. And uh, atmospheric space comes with um, a, you know, a certain number of, of things. So it's the, you know, the right to breathe clean air. It's the right to, um, to exist in a sustainable and abundant way. And if we think about the, if you break down this whole sort of carbon climate crisis to emissions per capita, then you're getting closer to this idea of atmospheric space. How much um, is each person allowed to emit? How much clean air is each person um, entitled to? And so uh, when you use the frame of equitable atmospheric space, it becomes a lot clearer that some people take up a lot more atmospheric space than others. And there's a deep imbalance there. There's a very new framing around um, uh, that an economist called Jason Hickel has, has sort of started using, and it's um, the idea of atmospheric appropriation. And that is also related to this idea of equitable atmospheric space. And it's this idea that um, through this inequitable economic structure that we've created, um, that that economic structure and that economic system enables appropriation of atmospheric space from those at the bottom of the structure towards those at the top. And so that's, a diff that's another way of thinking about how do we equitably divide up our atmospheric space and, uh, and another framing, which you may have heard as well, is the idea of the carbon budget, the idea that we only have, um, that we have a budget similar to your financial budget, a budget of carbon that we can, that we have left to emit into the atmosphere before we hit that 1.5 degree um, uh, tipping point or the two degree tipping point. And so then if you take that remaining budget, how do you equitably divide up that budget? And in order to do that, you have to look at the history of emissions. You have to look at the ongoing inequities and how different groups of people are subjected to different economic injustices and that um, that places them at the sort of bottom of this, of this inequitable structure. And so the idea of carbon budget is there's all these different factors that go into determining who gets what size of a piece of the pie. 
And so I think the, the closing thought here is that there's all these different ways to think about climate justice. But fundamentally, it comes down to this idea that the ecological processes of climate change, the, uh, the tipping points, the uh, disasters, the climate impacts, the fires, the floods, the slow ongoing impacts that are happening in all of the ecologies around the world are indelibly shaped and sculpted by the paradigm and the economics framework that underpin the fundamental inequity of the climate crisis. In other words, it is policy choices that determine the way that the climate crisis plays out ecologically. And so those two are inextricably linked. The way in which certain ecosystems are made more vulnerable, the way that certain people are made more vulnerable um, are because of policy choices. And so you cannot separate uh, the two of them. And that's where we arrive at this deadlock, um, um, this political deadlock that we find ourselves in on climate. And so in this time of crisis, which we're all certainly feeling today, it's very hard for us to stop and to breathe and to look deeper into the heart of the crisis. And it's hard for us to think about what ugly truths lie at the heart of it. But the truth of it is that's the only way we can actually win on this thing. We can only win by uniting our struggles and by finding the threads that connect all the different parts of our knowledge and all the different movements that are coming together around this, um, this global crisis. Um, we can only win by thinking about the social and economic underpinnings of an ecological crisis, because they're all symptoms of the same disease, after all. Uh, social movements around the world have a long history of winning big victories by connecting these different pieces, social and economic struggles to major crises that are happening at the time. And I'll bring up a kind of a weird example, but actually the World War II, and I'm steeped in this every day because I work at the Climate Emergency Unit where we talk about the wartime as an analogy for confronting the climate crisis. And we talk about um, the social programs, major social programs that were enacted at the end of the war um, with the promise that the world after the war was to be fairer and safer and more equitable than the society going into the war. And obviously that promise was not fulfilled for so many people here in Canada. And so, I mean, and around the world, but it's the concept of it that we can take the lesson from that in order, in order to actually be able to promise and gain people's trust that we can get through this crisis together, you have to promise that there will be measures in place for the world to be fairer and safer on the other side. Um, one of the big social programs that I actually find really inspiring from that time was an excess profits tax on corporations uh, during the wartime where corporations were taxed up to 100% after a certain level of profits. And so research shows that societies with lower levels of economic inequality are also the ones where bolder climate action is possible. And there's a lot of different correlations that happen there as well, but I think it's an interesting idea for us to think about. And I know that my fellow speakers are gonna go into that as well. So thank you so much and um, happy to chat more about this. Great, that's that to follow. <laughs> um, I do want to thank the organizers uh, for um, holding this event and truly I'm so honored to be on a panel with these amazing climate justice leaders and educators. So um, I'll do my best to follow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I've been tasked with talking about today is um, intersections between my research and climate justice. And so, um, as Arjia mentioned before, for context, I'm an assistant professor here at UBC and the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability, and also the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And in general, the research in my group is focused on reimagining how we assess the impacts of technology and policy on environment and society to inform future-oriented planning. And so when I say reimagine, part of that is about leveraging kind of state of the science uh, modeling tools and techniques, but in a way that is fit to purpose in terms of the decision context for technology and policy. Um, and part of that is also about taking a more holistic view of what we mean by impacts and drawing on diverse knowledge systems as we do that assessment. And so in the context of um, 
supporting climate action, this question of how we think about justice and assessment is increasingly important. And a huge part of this draw, like is not necessarily on the academic side, but from our um, partners outside of academia, um, the government partners we work with, the community partners we work with. So I thought I would start just by sharing a couple of examples of where uh, research in my group has intersected with climate justice. But before I do that, I do want to acknowledge all the fabulous members of my group uh, whose work I'm gonna be drawing on for these examples. Um, as well as other key collaborators. So I'm not gonna, um, I will mention them by name later if there are questions, but just know that I'm, this work is really from a, a huge group of people. Uh, so the first example I'm gonna give is actually on the climate mitigation side. And this is where, um, like one of our questions is how do we enhance synergies between climate action and all these other things that we also want? Like we wanna decarbonize our systems, but at the same time, we also want cleaner air. And we also want to reduce environmental injustice. And, and what I mean by that um, in this context is one form, one way that environmental injustice manifests is that a lot of marginalized communities are disproportionately exposed to environmental hazards like air pollution. So one example of where this has come up um, in the research, uh, in my research and that of my collaborators is actually uh, around freight transportation. So transportation is like contributes about a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions in, in Canada. And of that, about 40% is freight. And what I mean by freight is like stuff. So like we move people, but we also move like goods and everything else. Um, and because a lot of, you know, to move all this stuff, we're often talking about like big, powerful, diesel powered uh, vessel, like ships, trains, trucks, planes. Um, these vehicles actually, because they're using um, uh, this diesel also actually are major sources of air pollution. Uh, diesel is like a, a quite polluting fuel. Um, and actually the air pollution actually also disproportionately impacts a lot of marginalized communities. So um, one example is that you can think about is like communities around ports. So a lot of port communities, you have this like real concentration of like heavy freight infrastructure, right? Like rail lines, ships, trucks, they're all going there. Uh, and uh, a lot of the communities that surround ports are disproportionately low income, black, indigenous, and people and, and communities of, of color mm -hmm. actually. Uh, and so this is an example from Vancouver. Um, this is where you can see, um, you know, one of the terminals around Strathcona and the downtown east side. So one way that people sometimes talk about, um, you know, areas like this is there's this idea of like a sacrifice zone, being that we all actually benefit from the economic activity that is going, like th this is, uh, Vancouver is the largest port in Canada, right? We're all benefiting from, from trade that is happening through here. But, but some of those impacts are really concentrated, like that air pollution impact of all those freight vehicles is really concentrated on these communities. And so when you talk about decarbonizing freight transport, actually this is a really great opportunity, not only to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but also improve air quality and also try to address some of the environmental injustice that communities that are disproportionately affected are, 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 are facing. So this is actually a question that we've been trying to work on, which is to try to quantify these co-benefits and use that to try to prioritize different sorts of interventions to maximize or, or try to really enhance our opportunities, right? So like, let these first actions that we take be ones that are really advancing these multiple goals at the same time. And a lot of this is work with partners, which includes community groups in Strathcona and the downtown east side, but also um, local health authorities, for instance, who um, are really concerned about um, what the impacts might be for residents and supportive housing in these areas. Um, and so uh, I think this is one, uh, this has actually been a really cool opportunity for me and my collaborators to actually apply some of this really like cool research infrastructure and new toys from funded by the Canada Foundation for, uh, for Innovation. Because um, all of these um, new tools are actually allowing us to quantify emissions of greenhouse gases and air pollutions in real world conditions and at fine spatial scale so that we can actually understand what the disproportionate impacts might actually be. So this is my, um, this is one example of how I think we can use our research to really um, uh, make sure or, or think about opportunities for climate action to also uh, enhance some of our goals in terms of environmental justice. Uh, the second example I'll give though is on the uh, adaptation side. So, whoops, okay, I kind of messed up here. Sorry. Um, what I'm showing here on the left is, this is a figure from NASA. It's the uh, air temperature anomaly to, at two meter height for June 29th, uh, 2021, which is when um, we really experienced in the Western part of this continent, you know, record breaking, you know, heat dome events. 
And on the right, it's actually an excerpt from a paper from Professor Rachel White, uh, which is um, definitely encourage you to read it if you haven't. Um, and here it's showing what the impacts of this heat wave were in terms of wildfire conditions. And indeed, what followed this record breaking heat were really devastating fires um, that impacted a large swath, of particularly of the interior of British Columbia. And so this is actually, um, these are the conditions that a lot of our communities are facing in increasingly in a co-occurring way, um, extreme heat and also wildfire smoke. And so the other thing that we know about these impacts is also that um, they are not born equally. Uh, those impacts are also being um, disproportionately experienced by um, uh, both different sorts of communities and different people with different degrees of biological susceptibility, right? So when we think about adaptation interventions, we also need to make sure that our interventions are responsive to these different kinds of vulnerability. And like I said, some of that might be biological susceptibility. So if you have asthma or if you are an elderly person, you might be more susceptible to the impacts of heat or poor air quality. But some of this is also social vulnerability, right? In terms of who has access to uh, what resources and when. So ideally, um, what we would like to see would be uh, that, um, we're gonna to work towards the goal where everyone has access to clean and cool air at their home. Um, and so this is actually a reminder of the ways in which climate justice is actually also linked to housing justice, right? Because the reality is actually not, a lot of people don't have access to clean and cool air in the context of these extreme events, right? And so one intervention in the interim, as we're working towards that goal where everyone can have it, particularly for communities like uh, people who are underhoused or um, renters who don't have as much control, let's say over their, um, their housing is this intervention of clean and cool air shelters, which a lot of municipalities um, are now implementing. And this idea being that this is a place where you can go to um, uh, you know, have relief from some of these environmental stressors. So um, I had the pleasure recently of working with a, of being a faculty supervisor for a team of three PhD students who are part of this pilot project on transdisciplinary research in the context of PhDs. And so they were working with um, partners at Metro Vancouver, which is our regional government, on thinking about, well, how do we think about, how do we um, use an equity and justice lens to think about how these clean and cool air shelter programs are designed and implemented? And that comes down to questions of like, where are they placed? Um, how are they advertised? What kinds of um, operational measures? What are the um, uh, staffing, um, infrastructure, HVAC system, all sorts of considerations um, around this. So, okay, I gave these two examples and these are two examples where I would say the research questions have more centrally been about um, justice in the context of climate action, whether that's mitigation or adaptation. But um, in the context of speaking in, in this department, you know, not, not all of the research projects in my group um, have such an explicit focus, let's say, in the research question um, on uh, questions of justice. So for instance, there's also work in our group that we do on the impacts of climate on biogeochemical cycling of contaminants. Um, and so there's this question of like, okay, well, if it's not the explicit focus, like where are those climate justice intersections? And so for me, actually, um, I think a useful analogy for me has been thinking about uncertainty. So for instance, like not all of the research <clears throat> projects I do are explicitly about uncertainty. Like the goal is not necessarily we're trying to quantify or constrain, or this is a new uncertainty quantification technique, but everything I do is implicated by uncertainty and the work I do, uh, and those results also have implications for uncertainty. And so even if it's not the explicit focus of the paper, normally I discuss it, right? Like at the end, we, you know, what do these results mean in the context of? And so that's actually how I also try to think about questions of justice in the context of my earth science research um, is that even if it's not explicitly the focus, like what does this, what are the equity implications or how do those larger structures and frameworks also kind of filter through into my work? And so these are some of the questions um, that sometimes um, in, in our group, we try to ask ourselves about our research as we're thinking about that. So one is this question of for whom? And in an earth science context, actually often this is about questions of distribution. Like, are we actually doing our analysis in a way so that we can understand what the distributions are, understand heterogeneity, understand um, where there might be um, uh, different sorts of impacts? And if not, being really transparent about that, right? Like, okay, this is an average and it doesn't represent 
all the sorts of extremes that people are going to, or we're using this one representative site, but it might not actually capture um, everything that matters to uh, different sorts of groups. So that's one question that, that we ask. And sometimes we try to push to be able to do that uh, better. So for instance, like I said, sometimes that means we need to do things at finer spatial resolution or temporal resolution. And that actually requires like a whole bunch of um, you know, innovations in terms of the methodologies that we're using as well. Right? Another key question though is by whom? So like who was involved in designing the research? How might this impact the design and interpretation? And closely related to that is this question of like with whose knowledge? Um, which disciplines and which ways of knowing are represented and what might be missed if we're not including multiple. So for example, like in some of our work in the context of the Beaufort Sea, uh, we work with um, our partners in the Inuvialuit Game Council and Hunters and Trappers Committees to identify sources of Inuvialuit knowledge that can help us also understand environmental change in the region. These two process elements are actually, I think, also an important part of climate justice. It's not just about the outcomes, but also about how we get there and how we're doing that work. Um, and I would say that, you know, not all of the work in our group is participatory always, not all of it is necessarily always using diverse knowledge systems, but when it's not, I think um, what sometimes we have a responsibility to do then is just to be transparent about that, to be transparent about like what is the position that we're coming from and what is what are parts of the story that we might not be able to tell given the sorts of, um, given who was involved and the kinds of knowledge systems that we're drawing on. I mean, I think that too is actually a really important part as researchers um, of thinking about climate justice. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, boy, it's just amazing to be here with such uh, incredible speakers. Um, yeah, I'm just going to talk about a uh, little class that I've been working on um, that hopefully will have uh, some lessons in there that, that have been helpful to me, at least. Uh, in terms of teaching uh, a climate justice course. Um, so that class is ATMS 100. Um, the 100 is actually the 100 emoji, 100% real. Um, and it, it actually, it, it, means, uh, it means something. It means 100% clean energy for 100% of the people. Right? Um, we're still working on getting the emoji in the course guide that has some, some technical issues there. But um, anyway, yeah. Um, so I uh, developed this course over uh, the last like three or so years. We've taught it maybe four times now. It's like a big gen ed type class. Um, so we get students from all different departments taking it. Um, and then uh, going along with uh, the development of those course materials, I had to learn a lot to do this. I'm still very much not an expert. I'm still just trying to do my best uh, on any given day. Um, tried to uh, make uh, book to go along with it. That's an open uh, textbook um, with the same name, Climate Justice and Energy Solutions. Um, so y'all can check that out. Um, yeah, um, it's Creative Commons, sort of like acknowledging that I'm not really an expert on this. Anybody can access it. Anybody can modify it uh, for their own uses um, as long as you don't sell it, right? Um, I was I was inspired by, uh, I think this is in a, a Kind of just this document that I'll talk about in a little while, you know, not copyright, copyright. We gotta <laughs> get these, uh, gotta get these ideas out there. Um, yeah, and um, what we try to do in this class is teach uh, from the perspective of the global climate justice movement, um, which is actually pretty unified um, with some of the, you know, tenants that were mentioned earlier, right? Um, so. That's trying to be the perspective of the class. Um, you know, we're still teaching numbers, we're still teaching the facts, right? But um, it, it, it's kind of like trying to do it in a way that, um, you know, those groups would be all right with it, you know? Um, so one way, to, one way to do that, I think um, that's useful if y'all are thinking of uh, bringing this into your own classes, for instance, is to look at some of these foundational documents. Um, so for instance, one of those that's really, really important is called the Jemez Principles. Um, this one um, is just one page worth, you know, you can go through uh, super, super quick to understand it, but I think maybe the most important one in my perspective is let those people who were most affected speak for themselves, right? So don't kind of assume that you know what's best for somebody unless you actually hear it from themselves or representative, right? So I think in terms of teaching, that means we do look at a lot of uh, 
those primary sources, right? We look at those uh, folks who who um, are affected and uh, and what they're saying about it. Um, and a lot of those solutions get much more to the core of mm -hmm. uh, the problem as well. Um, uh, so I think it's a useful perspective for all sorts of scientists to consider. Um, the principles of environmental justice, uh, EJ is the abbreviation here, and climate justice um, by the Climate Justice Alliance um, are you know, relatively short tenants. And we actually have the um, students read uh, all of those and do you know, homework exercises about it. Um, this one has a, a kind of funny name, Hoodwinked in the Hot House, um, but is a really fantastic uh, document that is essentially about what is deemed false solutions by the uh, climate justice movement. And, you know, a lot of these we don't talk about as that in academia, you know, probably we all work on these, you know, some, maybe some, I've worked on some of these, right? Um, but uh, they go through pretty clearly why things like geoengineering, you know, spraying aerosols into the air might be considered a false solution. Nuclear is uh, too slow, too dirty, too dangerous. Um, one other one, which I forget, too expensive. Um, and these are uh, pretty well referenced uh, as well. They're, you know, it, it's written in like a graphic format with illustrations on each page, right? But it's actually a very academic document. It has all those sources in there, you know? Um, so there are these sources, um, they're out there, um, they're not hard to find. Um, yeah, um, the People's Agreement of Cochabamba um, is another one that uh, my students call it a banger. There's a lot of like <laughs> good stuff in there. Um, yeah, uh, of the like global climate justice movement. Um, I think a lot of this, uh, you know, is is very different than what what we're taught. The way that we're taught to think of as a scientist, which is this reductionist approach, right? Um, a lot of times these justice solutions are looking at more of a systems perspective. Um, so, you know, got to learn a little bit about how to think in those ways. Um, how specifically do we incorporate these into science lessons? Um, well, we talk about um, orders of magnitude in uh, this Terra scale planet uh, where we go through basically in some detail about what's a trillion, um, that it is a key unit for the world of today, right? It's like 120 per per capita right now, right? Um, and uh, start to get into how actually the world is plenty, provides plenty for that many people um, if you look at basic needs, um, right? So uh, world population wealth inequality is certainly on the trillion dollar scale, even if you just gather the fir you know, first dozen uh, richest folks. Um, availability of solar power, for instance, to provide uh, adequate electricity for everybody is way, way larger than that. That's actually the peta scale um, quadrillion, right? Um, power versus energy is another one um, that I think there's some lessons uh, in that uh, power, just that rate of energy usage per time is more appropriate for uh, steady renewable sources, right? Whereas uh, energy, is just a you know finite amount, right? So all the fossil fuel reserves are always measured in things like barrels of oil equivalent, right? Um, and if you kind of reframe to thinking about power rather than energy, it can maybe be a way to uh, understand the science a little bit more um, and also sort of shift towards the renewable way of thinking. Um, another one is uh, emphasizing sufficiency rather than uh, affluence-based uses of energy. Um, learned about this from uh, uh, some great talks and, and documents from uh, Indigenous Climate Action or Indigenous Environmental Network um, or uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, I think is really terrific for scientists, especially to learn about some of these Indigenous uh, philosophies and how they can be applied. Because um, she's a Western scientist as well as an Indigenous scientist and can uh, kind of cross those worlds. Um, there's this uh, great set of work by uh, folks like uh, Nerissi Morau and uh, Julie Steinberger, uh, Decent Living with Minimum Energy, that looks at sufficiency. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's uh, been a place where it's easy to see that 
just having enough for everybody to have a good life, you know, free of uh, uh, toil, you know, your dishwasher and clothes washer and everything. Um, if you use the best efficiency practices, then it's quite low energy to support that. Um, so uh, we did a little bit of uh, investigation of that in particular uh, by making this interactive tool that lets you uh, develop your own definition of a decent living. Um, so you can choose your climate zone, you know, how big your residence is, uh, what kind of building materials, uh, heating, and it's got eight different pages of these. It's kind of a carbon footprint calculator, but also looks at the energy that's needed to support that. Um, and then you can feed that into, if everyone is allowed that much, right? How much uh, power would you need to, to support that? Um, yeah, this is another one. We like making these little uh, interactive tools as y'all can uh, see here. Um, in this one, uh, hopefully informed by that, you can look at how much electricity, uh, how much renewables you would need uh, to build to support that. Um, it goes along with uh, some of uh, Jason Hickel's other work about uh, like degrowth in the more affluent parts of the world, um, while at the same time bringing uh, everybody to, to sufficient uh, for a decent living. Um, yeah. Um, another great way to show climate justice in the physical sciences classes uh, mapping. Um, and there's so many of these interactive tools that have been built uh, that are out there uh, to explore these data sets. Uh, like in Washington, we have this uh, fantastic uh, environmental health disparities map. Um, and we have an exercise in the class where we compare these with redlining maps, which was this racist policy that uh, led to not as many folks of color to have the same benefits in those post-World War II programs. Um, and you can see that they line up quite well today. There's so much behind uh, housing um, and, uh, and, and inequality with pollution, also with urban heat island, right? Um, you can compare these sorts of maps um, and there's terrific uh, sources for this, like NPR, for instance, uh, did uh, a fantastic uh, study of how urban heat island uh, effects within cities uh, across the United States uh, compared with historical redlining maps. Um, Try to also bring in some history of environmental justice activism. Um, so uh, for instance, when we talk about soot pollution, one of the main centers of that right now is the river state of Nigeria. There's a lot of uh, uh, kind of like uh, art, artisanal fuel refining. Um, so there's this really, really bad soot pollution there. Um, and just sort of telling the story of how there's been a lot of people who resisted that, um, including Ken Sarawiwa, um, who eventually paid for, with his life for that. Um, uh, but, it, you know, um, amazing activist that still inspires uh, lots of folks today. Um, another one is the Environmental, Jutless, Environmental Justice Atlas, ejatlas.org. Um, this is uh, built by academics, not me, but um, these are thousands of environmental justice struggles uh, worldwide where you can click on each of these and find out something about what happened and uh, even, you know, pictures from the ground and stuff like that, the folks that are protesting, right? So maybe you're a person who studies climate impacts in a particular place. Um, I think this can be a way where you can uh, really take it home um, take people into these locations and see what kind of other battles they've been uh, fighting. Um, yeah, and then uh, I think it's also important to connect to the movements of today um, as well. Um, so each chapter in our little book um, connects to a currently active climate justice organization. And mostly these are just optional reading, uh, but um, we do have an assignment at the end where uh, they have to compare their choice of a couple of these groups. Um, so just see that all of this is happening right now, right? Um, the goals of each of these groups has been is uh, changing from 
you know, day to day adapting to the uh, new struggles. Um, yeah, and we also allow students to bring in their own groups there too, um, to sort of allow folks from any political persuasion to bring in what they see um, as important work that's happening. Um, yeah, final word, um, climate impacts are never just determined by those physical variables, right? As a physical scientist, I think we always have to remember this, right? There's always those social factors underneath and there's always people there that are working to make things better, right? So I think highlighting those stories of the people who are there working on those problems is 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 always good. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, Hadith, Suzy, Janela Point, Salatan, Inkez, Luxoyu, Asli. Uh, Alu and Michelle Baker, Atsu and Emma Baker, Atsian and Willie Baker, uh, Mustang Squamish, Slavatooth, Tuzu, Yankatekba, Betsy Ninja Nasya. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Janella Point. I am from Salatan First Nation. That's a really small community in the north central part of so called British Columbia, about a couple of hours west of Prince George, if you know where that is. And, um, as this protocol, I was just introducing in my language that I'm Caribou Clan um, and introducing my matrilineal grandparents. So my grandmother, Emma Baker, she is a badass Dekaf elder, language teacher, um, residential school survivor, and uh, my late grandfather, Willie Baker, who is Black and Choctaw from um, New Mexico State. And yeah, I'm really happy to be here today. Really grateful to my fellow speakers that teed me up so well and to the organizers for having me. Um, yeah, I'm here to share a little bit more about um, climate justice as an indigenous justice, um, both about, you know, the climate movement specifically about um, colonization as a root cause of, of the climate crisis, but also, I, I think just as people living, working, teaching on these lands, it's really important that um, we find a way to highlight indigenous struggle, indigenous joy, indigenous issues um, in all facets of our teaching. So I hope um, I can give you some ideas for that today. This is me. Aww. Yeah, I know. I was cute. Um, I, I often start with this when I'm presenting because I've been doing climate justice organizing in a traditional sense since 2018. But I always say my work as a, a land defender and a water protector started before I was even born. And I think a lot of my understanding of, of that work actually happened at this age. Um, so I was a really shy, curious kid. Um, I'm a middle child. I have middle middle child syndrome. My mom had um, responsibility of a, a bratty teenager, um, my baby sister, and then me, who was left to run freely, um, which was really great because I got to build a relationship with um, with my home territory, which is um, the traditional territory of my grandmother Emma. And yeah, I spent a lot of time outside, um, and really was like immersed in my culture, got to spend a long time directly with my grandmother and elder, other elders in my community. Um, I love salmon. When I was in second grade and started school, we did like a little presentation on our favorite animal. And I don't know what your favorite animal was when you're eight, but for most kids, it's like a puppy or a kitty or like an elephant or a tiger if you're really out there. And I was like, I love sockeye salmon. <laughs> um, so yeah, I like, I got to grow up um, for the first 18 years of my life on my territory. It's one of my favorite places. I just got to spend a lot of time there this summer. Um, yeah, really getting to connect with the rivers and the forests. Um, but it's also an epicenter where I, I saw a lot of the impacts of um, extraction on my territory. So um, my community is right along the, the highway of tears where Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit have gone disproportionately missing or have been found murdered. Um, which is really linked to the ongoing extraction in the area. I grew up without clean drink, drinking water, even though the municipality next to me um, was able to drink right from the tap. There are ancient species in my territory, like the white sturgeon that has survived ice ages and are right now um, at risk of going extinct from the damming of the rivers, um, all these things. And I didn't really have the language for it when I was a, a child, but when I, Left my community to go to university. I attended Thompson Rivers University in so-called Kamloops. I feel like I was carrying a lot of that. I was really homesick, um, missing my community, and I think also had a lot of grief and trauma that I didn't really have 
um, words for or were able to link. And I had this kind of profound impact, um, this profound experience in university where I was attending an awards gala and um, there was a little elder there to do the land acknowledgement from the Cosley, which is really close to where I grew up. And she reminded me so much of my grandmother, like both in stature and the cadence of her voice, the way she was speaking. And she did like such a beautiful land acknowledgement. She was really speaking about um, the responsibility of as students, as faculty um, on the lands of the Sultanate of Hulu um, to, to all the living beings, the rivers, the mountains, the forests, to the fish, she was even saying to the creepy crawlies and the insects. And I was really closing my eyes and listening to my word, her words and was getting quite emotional. Um, and when I opened my eyes, I saw that she was kind of quickly being helped off stage. And what came behind her was this big half a million dollar check um, to Thompson Rivers University from uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline. And I thought, whoa, that is poignant. Um, literally a removal of an Indigenous elder to make way for this massive donation. And I was kind of like stunned by it, um, but all the people around me were getting up to applaud because um, of course an investment of the size had a lot of benefits to the university. And um, it was to me really showing that a lot of people in the university weren't making um, the link and they were really just seeing the short term benefits um, and dollar signs um, that was offered. But I knew this project was quite contentious and I knew that there was actually um, land defense um, being organized around the issue. So that's where I kind of got my start. I listened to the elder um, about my responsibility to the lands and started organizing in solidarity with indigenous groups that were um, opposing Trans Mountain Pipeline. That was a natural transition when I moved to Vancouver and, and still there was many Indigenous nations downstream that were also fighting the same pipeline. Um, I started organizing um, with Wet'suwet'en Solidarity that's also fighting Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, um, which is very close to my home and also being built through my territory. Um, and then, yeah, eventually transitioned into a role at the David Suzuki Foundation where I still work today. Um, but yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that that poignant picture that was painted um, about the the removal of an indigenous elder to make way um, for extraction. I think the the foundation of understanding how indigenous justice relates to climate justice is about understanding the, the history and the ongoing struggle of indigenous peoples on these lands. Um, and this is hard. I feel like. Um, Canada really has a national identity that's like Canada the, the good of like being a very tolerable um, multicultural nation and of course there are um, many benefits that we enjoy in, in living in so-called Canada um, but its foundation just just like other um, settler states in the world was founded on racism white supremacy and colonization and really the systemic um, removal of indigenous people from their land um, specifically for the reason of gaining access to resource to be able to, to build the economy um, that is still ongoing today. Um, so Canada was, was founded in 1867 and right away granted all power to the land to its um, colonial successor, giving the state exclusive control of the land. And then 10 years later, the Indian Act was created, which is still legislation that is living and used today um, that was really designed to control and to dominate Indigenous peoples, to dispossess them from the land um, and to assimilate them into the culture. And of course, um, yeah, it's not just about stolen land, as Anjali told us, it's also about stolen labor. Um, for post-World War II, we also saw that, you know, Asian and Black populations were systemically excluded from the Canadian economy. They were kept below 1% of the population. Um, and used to create um, railway projects. They're subject to Jim Crow laws that do Canada learned from the United States and practices that were, were used all the way up until the 1960s in Canada. Um, so the, where does that get us today? It's, you know, we're, we're seeing the impacts of having an economy that is based on constant growth, constant extraction and on the removal of indigenous people. Um, environmental racism isn't a problem that's exclusive to other countries. I often hear examples of environmental racism in the United States, but it's super prevalent um, here in Canada. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up without clean drinking water in my community. There's high levels of arsenic found in our water and arsenic cannot be boiled away. 
um, and it was um, suspected to become from mine pollution. There's a lot of health impacts that from that in my community. And we just got clean drinking water in 2019, which is pretty unbelievable for um, a country as rich and prosperous as Canada. And um, I wanted to highlight um, Grassy Narrows, which is another community that um, is severely impacted by environmental racism because um, there was a rally happening today in Toronto. Um, so basically in the 1960s and 70s, the red reed paper um, paper mill dumped about 10 tons of mercury into the river. Um, and today the Grassy Narrows First Nation, 90% um, of their population has mercury poisoning and symptoms because of that. That's pretty um, unbelievably high. Um, they have rare forms of cancer. Um, they have a, a huge suicide crisis right now. So uh, Indigenous communities have higher rates than non-Indigenous communities and Grassy Narrows specifically is about three times higher than Indigenous communities. So um, yeah, it's really devastating. Um, and not just highlighting the impacts of specific projects, um, but also in the climate consequences that we're all feeling this summer. Um, I think, yeah, there was, of course, there's massive wildfires, some that are going to burn straight till winter happening right now. And 42% of the evacuations that took place this summer were Indigenous communities. And then Indigenous communities, of course, have also unique struggles with the jurisdiction between provincial and federal government that usually leads to a lot of finger pointing and delayed resources to these communities. Um, so yeah, it's like ongoing impacts of past extraction. There's still problems with both climate mitigation and adaptation in communities. Um, but despite this, Indigenous communities have been the strongest force of extraction. Um, this is a picture from the Wet Raid in 2019, where the police raided and were ready to shoot what so much in people who were rightfully defending their land as, as based on their, their sovereignty that was even confirmed by the Canadian courts in the Dalgamuk um, Supreme Court case. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to highlight um, how invested the, the state is in keeping Indigenous peoples dispossessed of the land. Um, there has been millions and millions of dollars um, poured into the RCMP. The RCMP even have a specialized unit um, that is specifically deployed to stop predominantly Indigenous communities from stopping extraction. And those communities are, are up against giants, they're up against the biggest polluters in the country that have a lot of money and power um, and are doing that for all of us. They're, 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 they're the ones holding us back um, from all the emissions and all the projects that are right now on the floor in so-called Canada. Um, so so where does that lead us? I think it's, it's really highlighting um, yeah, just how entangled land theft and, and the disposition and the impover the systemic poverty placed on Indigenous communities is in um, perpetuating resource extraction and continuing to profit off of Indigenous lands and, and emitting. Um, but it's not just, um, you know, what, what the corporations are doing. I think we also have to look at the history of climate um, work and climate justice isn't just like a new term for work that's already happening. It's an admittance that we have gotten this wrong in, in a lot of ways. I think early climate work, environmentalism and conservationism really left Indigenous people out of the equation. Um, they were focused on conservation, which really separates um, the natural world from, from humans, which is really antithetical to Indigenous worldviews. Um, so if we're going to do this right and address the crisis at hand, it's important that um, we're standing in solidarity with um, the Indigenous people on the front lines of the climate crisis, the ones that are in the front lines of um, uh, fighting against extraction. Um, I think right now, all of the, the major corporations in Canada pour a lot of money into building relationships with the Indigenous community um, to take advantage of the systemic poverty um, in order to get these mutual benefit agreements to push pipelines. Um, so it's really important for us as settlers and guests on these lands that we're invested in not only climate justice, but seeing um, cash reparations for past and ongoing extraction that happened on Indigenous lands so that Indigenous communities have the resources to be able to say no to these projects. Um, I think it's we can practice these things in our daily life just by um, building solid relationships. I always say the foundation of power is strong relationships. So. Um, this could include going to community events, finding out more about whose nations you're on. There's about 200 distinct First Nations in British Columbia. Um, and so 
yeah, building relationships in the community, going to community events, learning the appropriate place names and pronunciation and in indigenous languages, um, ensuring that that our climate solutions are rooted in in um, indigenous sovereignty, reading the United um, Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, and seeing how those apply to the the work we are teaching. Um, Indigenous people are the only people who have been able to live sustainably on these lands since millennia. So there's also a lot of land use practices that um, we can we can learn from. And just yeah, really quickly before I wrap, I just want to highlight um, a story that was told to me by my grandmother. Um, a lot of the nations in so-called BC, when they heard of settlers coming from the south, um, met to to discuss how they would deal with with the ongoing settlers. And so they placed kind of a vote by placing rocks on either side. One was like, should we fight these settlers off because we have members, we have knowledge of the land. And then two was to, to invite the settlers in to see um, what, what they could do for us. Cause that was the way that our nations had been operating was to be learning and sharing with indigenous nations. And my grandma um, tells the story of the, the vote to fight the settlers off was about knee high. and. Um, the vote to learn from the settlers and welcome them onto our lands was bigger than a house. Um, so I just want to want to say that um, it's important that we're all accepting that invitation to be um, knowledge sharers, um, learning what we can do for each other, um, and to not only um, yes see our work in Indigenous solidarity as like the right thing to do because bad things happen in the past, but like to really see our stake in it as like the only path to survival is to learn from the people that have survived um, for millennia on these lands. Um, yeah, so I'll leave that there. Looking forward to the discussion and thanks again for your time and attention.